Hi, everyone. Hi. Well, welcome to Tech Tip Talk. I am Sarah Walworth. I'm Christina McGrath, and we are Knitting Tech Editors. So here on Tech Tip Talk, we answer your questions about tech editing, pattern writing, knitting design. And we invite you now, if you are here live, to throw your comments and questions into the chat and we'll do our best to answer during the broadcast. This month, we're chatting with tech editor and creator Becky Monahan, who also offers schematic creation. Becky has an engineering background and puts it to excellent use in her schematic drawings. If you have not seen her work, you have to check it out. They are beautiful. Um, we can't wait to talk with her today and find out her secrets and her take on all of that. So exciting. So let's bring Becky into the room. Hi, Becky. Hi. And put you center stage. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you on the show. Um, we have, we have, oh, let's see who is here. Hi, Natalie. Yeah. Natalie's in the audience and we have other people joining us. And maybe we jump straight into questions if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, how did you get started working in the knitting industry? Um, working in the knitting industry, when my girls were getting a little bit older, I was homeschooling and I found myself knitting a lot while I was supervising. Like elementary students, like they can do some stuff independently, but you have to be right there because they have a lot of questions. So I found knitting was a great way to pass the time, but I also was feeling a little understimulated. And so I started doing test knitting um, just because I liked the challenge. It was fun to test things out. And after working with several different designers doing their testing, um, they appreciated the notes that I was providing them. And to a couple of them asked if I'd be interested in editing for them. Yes. So I just kind of jumped right in. I skipped the training class stage, which um, wasn't a big deal with the actual work, but it was a deal with the business side of it. And I wish I had done some business classes to better set up my business from the get-go instead of making it a hobby thing where I was kind of paying for my yarn, but kind of not earning money. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of us that start as tech editors and we're like, hey, we want to edit and we're so excited about editing. And then we're like, oh, yeah, but we have to run a business. Yeah. OK, well, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> tricky. Well, I was so focused on like what I was learning that I was going to do for my job. But you're also uh, an entrepreneur and like self-employed and you have to mm -hmm. run a business. And that's a whole nother thing to learn. You're totally right. It's a whole nother set of skills. So did you feel like you got your feet under you with that? Um, I did. It's taken, I've had some growing pains. Yeah. Like when I sat down and realized I was making minimum wage ah! because I wasn't taking an account like the self-employment. I was paying self-employment taxes, but you don't really think about that when you're setting your hourly rate. Right. And right. I also wasn't taking into account all of the time. Um, on the back end, doing email correspondence and marketing and all those unpaid tasks, tasks and yeah. marketing yourself, admin, yes. scheduling, invoicing. Right. Yeah. So all those things add up. And so realizing, oh, wait, I'm not paying myself enough to keep the sustainable. Yeah. And I, I feel like this is something that many of us end up having problems with. So Growing pains is normal. <laughs> Do you feel like you feel like you're kind of getting through the Yes. Hunting? Yeah. Christina's okay. given me some good advice. Um, Anastasia from yes. oh, what is her new marketing business Make name? One, oh, Make right. one. Yes. Um, Make yeah, one, one R marketing, right? Yes. Yes. Has been really influential too in that, you know, we need to recognize our worth and be willing yep. to charge that just like designers need to be recognizing their worth. Right. Um, I just had a new designer contact me yesterday. And the first thing I told her was your patterns need to at least triple in price. 
Mm -hmm. because what you're doing is not sustainable and you're not valuing your own creativity. Yeah. And I feel like we can't say this enough in our industry until there's like a serious change. Many of us, we just tend to slide into undervaluing. So this is, that's exciting. And I think it's helpful to build each other up. Like you can do it. It's okay. It's okay to charge more. (laughs) Because that's the problem. It's hard. I think designers really struggle with charging more for their patterns when they see others that aren't doing Mm -hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So it's this whole, like, it, and there needs to be a, a shift in the industry altogether, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's exciting. It's exciting to see that there's needs to be a change because I feel like when we recognize it, then that's when things can change. So yes. um, we have some people here from Europe. Hi, Anita in Denmark. And Natalie's here from the UK. And we're so excited that you guys are here joining us live. Uh, please put your questions for Becky into the comments because we we love to answer them. So, on to the next question: Do you edit? Do you edit knit or crochet or both? I only edit knitting. I have done a couple schematic drawings for crochet, but I don't know crochet well enough. Like I've made dishcloths. But that's it. That's where my crochet skills end. So I usually recommend, you know, even if it's a regular client, if they're doing something with crochet, there are other people who are skilled and that will be a better fit. Yeah, that's that makes sense. I end up in that boat, too. Um, So what's your specialty within knitting? What do you love to edit or grade or and why? I love garments. I, I I would do edit shawls and accessories, but they make my brain work harder. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Whereas I know I've talked to a couple other people that are opposite. They love shawls. Like shawls just are their easy edits. So and so I'm like, can I just like trade with you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's do it. I think I think there's a that is part of valuing yourself and your work time is specializing. So do you prefer a particular kind of con- construction in garments? Um, I'm mm-hmm. still getting my feet under me with like things like seamed set in garments, mm-hmm. set in sleeves. I've done several of them, but it is one where I end up finding myself plotting out the pattern. Like I'll use Stitch Mastery to actually plot out parts of it to oh. make sure that it makes sense because it's just not as intuitive for my brain. Um, And I think that's just because I mostly knit seamless garments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is okay too. I mean, you can specialize a niche down Mm -hmm. even within garments. It's very possible. Um, What is, what was the last thing that you edited? Like what kind of, what kind of garment or? Oh goodness, I did a couple last week, but I had, um, I posted on Instagram, I was hit in the face with a volleyball. Oh. (laughs) And that headache lasted for like four days, five days. Um, So I just was working on, I don't know what it was. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? what This is normal because here, okay, so like right now, I've got a sweater pattern on my desk I got to edit today. And I know when it's done, I'll be like, it's done out of my yes. brain onto the next one. <laughs> yeah. So I know I just did a really pretty um, shawl schematic that I'm really excited about. It has color work and different cables and details. And I can't wait for that one to um, be finalized so I can show it off. Um, I am in the process of grading three different sweaters. So two of those are pretty simple. One is a color work sweater that it goes all the way down the sleeves and the body. Mm -hmm. So trying to make the repeat staggers work for all of the different yoke depths and corresponding torso length. So they all have that same visual feel, even though it's a really wide range of sizes. I think it's 16 sizes. Wow. (laughs) Wow. That's going to be intense. That's cool. So that one's getting close. I need to work on that one this afternoon. So, And what is it about, about grading and editing garments that makes, like you said, makes it, is, it, is an easy fit for your brain and that's how your brain works? What is it about it? I, 
the math just makes sense in a way that like shawls it's the same it's similar math for shawls but it just doesn't visualize as easily mm -hmm. um the garments, I love that puzzle of the increased rates for the yoke and the depth and getting it so that you don't have a lot of extra fabric in the middle. Yeah. Um, just like getting it so it fits cleanly through the shoulders. I just, I love that puzzle. Even like sometimes I'll be editing and a designer will say, increase evenly around this many stitches. And I'm always writing to them like, can I just like write that out? Like exactly yeah. how they increase. <laughs> especially when it's different for every size like can we just make this so they don't have to click on a link and figure it like use the calculator to figure it out can we just write out every size yes especially because it's a digital pattern like it there right. it's it's totally okay to give more information yes a 24 page pattern is okay <laughs> yeah to make things easier to work from. I know as a knitter, I don't want to have to like go, oh, how am I going to do? Okay, let me go find in my calculator. Yes. Or, well, and sometimes like she was saying, it can make a difference where you're, where you're evenly increasing around and how the, how things the, fit. The, where the fabric's going to increase or decrease. Yeah. And even like the calculator that's often recommended for even increases is for working flat. And so it'll often have extras on the beginning and end. Well, then you end up with, when it's circular, it's not actually even anymore. Yes. That's a problem because then it's not the same. It's not like you're taking all the stitches into account because you have those extras on right. the end. So it works, but it could be more graceful. <laughs> I love it. And isn't this part of tech editing is this polishing, making yes. things more graceful <clears throat> word wise and instruction wise. So I love that word. Um, let's go back to schematics. Okay. Creating schematics is your forte. This is what's all over your, your Insta profile. So how did you get started with that? I think it's really funny because I don't consider myself artistic at all. Really? But, <laughs> but I love accuracy. Um, so even like <laughs> back in elementary school when we had art assignments and they'd be like, oh, here's this like still life and you have to draw it. I would get in trouble for putting in too many details. <laughs> right. So um, one of the, a good friend who's also done some designing, she had a hat pattern and she was like, you know, I think it would just help to have a visual of how these cables fit together of what it's going to look like do you think you could draw that i'm like no i'm i can't do that she's like well just try and she sent me her picture of like this is what my trying and it doesn't look good so i did and she was really encouraging and she's actually my um well it's megan and i was like everybody needs a megan in their life where yeah. it's just somebody who's a sounding board and a safe place to go you know i'm struggling like how do i reply to this email how do i this drawing just doesn't quite capture it. What is missing? Like just somebody that's safe. I'll have her, um, like if I'm, if I've graded a pattern and I've edited it, I'll sometimes have her do a second proofreading for me. I'll pay her to proofread just so it's that extra layer of eyes. Yeah. So she encouraged me. And so I, I've gone through a couple different iterations of how I do my drawings. And now, um, I do them all in vector so that way I can zoom in like each stitch can be like this big wow. on the screen <laughs> so that way I can get the stitches that right shape because like color work stitches are plump and they're almost heart shape but if you're doing something like ribbing gets very angular and just getting like that micro detail so that when it's back to the, the size full view on a page right that full view it all has that same feeling oh, i you're like speaking my language <laughs> i love the idea of looking at the shape of the stitches in order to create them so you talked a little bit about being accurate so why do you love creating schematics like what is it besides being accurate in creating the shapes um one thing that I've noticed, and even like a lot of my designer, a lot of the designers I work with would fall into like straight sizing. Like they're a small, a medium. So they knit their samples and they model them. And like, I guess I'm wearing a medium right now. So like I'm in that same category when 
your grading and pattern out to like a 70 inch bust, it can be hard for, or if you're a mid-sized designer and you have a very petite person wanting to knit your pattern, it can be hard to visualize like, how is that actually going to look on me? Right. So having a, I usually do my schematics for like the very middle of the range, like a 48 inch bust. So it's right in the middle and you get that feel of this is how the, the proportions will lay. So you can get that, you can see like how are, is the yoke depth? Like how right. will the neckline sit across the shoulders? Right. It just gives you a different perspective than only seeing modeled photos or seeing like a flat lay photo on there's gorgeous flat lay photos but again there's limitations to how does that correlate to what i'll be knitting yeah so it almost is a form of like size inclusivity where you're presenting an image that actually gives yes. a better appearance of what the finished piece is going to that's look what like. i'm trying to do like um in alicia Plummer's bibliophile mm -hmm. i think that's the right one it's a turtleneck sweater that she released last winter we actually included three different schematic drawings so one that is her sample size one that is like the 48 52 and one that is the largest size in the mid 70s so that way you could see like how is that neck going to fit within the shoulders right. how do those details go together just to give that added layer of confidence of it's worth my time knitting this because i know it was graded accurately enough that it's going to fit the way i expect or being able to see those measurements and say you know what my shoulders I've like, I have a friend who's smaller than me, but she does weightlifting and she has to modify every single sweater because she has these big, gorgeous, muscular shoulders and she can't fit into any of her pre weightlifting sweaters. Right. I love that you said that because when you were talking about choosing a size and modeling the schematic drawing after that middle mid range size, I've seen schematics where, um, they'll try to make them you know, you use the dotted lines to sort of say what some sizes will do and some sizes mm -hmm. um, do something different. So I love that you then said that some patterns you'll do three different schematics so people can see because there are often are um, construction elements that change, Yes. you know, across the size range and do place things a little bit differently right and like with that bibliophile pattern it was a compound raglan and so being able to show how that curve that, changed that curve mm -hmm. that's between awesome. the different sizes so being able to plot out and actually this is what it will do yeah which is nice with vector because oh i can select exact points <laughs> like i'll actually it. draw in millimeters so that way like one millimeter can be one inch or one centimeter like depending on how big i make the um artboard that's awesome so we're gonna we <laughs> one of the top questions that we get is do i need to include a schematic i mean i think for the first year that we were having broadcast this was like the question we got almost every episode and we want to hear your answer to this, since this is kind of your specialty is to provide this kind of information on a pattern. Do designers need to include a schematic? Yes, um, because otherwise, how will knitters know, like, what do you mean by armhole depth? Is that the depth out here? Mm -hmm. Is that the depth here? Or is it center back? Like, where exactly are those lines corresponding to? And you can include that with labels, like when you're writing out like armhole depth measured at mid back then back but it's just it's really useful to be able to see like okay those short row shaping that actually made the neckline come down so a lot of people think of like short row shaping makes the neck go up right which <laughs> kind of yes but that's actually pushing the front down right. um but at the same time I don't want a new designer to feel like, oh, I've got to spend all this money to get this schematic. Well, it's pretty, but do I see that cost benefit of, there's a lot of ways that you can do a really simple schematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could even do like take 
a flat lay picture of your sample and then use one of the free like iPad drawing right. or on your desktop, it's harder with a mouse um, to kind of trace that out mm -hmm. and just give a very simple schematic that will still help your knitters. It might not be as elegant, right? but in the long run, it's still going to help. Right. Exactly. Oh, I love it. That's such a great idea. So what are the, what do you think are the most important aspects to have in this image? For example, does it matter if it's stylized a little or if it's for the flat? schematic or the pattern photos? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, <laughs> go ahead, Christina. Well, so, you know, um, I think that there are schematics that, um, I feel like it's so important that you pay attention to the scale, right? And making sure that things, the parts of the um, item that are drawn are the right yes. size and shape. You can't just be like arm, arm, you know, and have them not be correct. Right. So what, what are the most important parts of the image that, that help you get that accuracy? You know, that's kind of what I was thinking about. And yes, pictures too. We'll talk about it. Yeah, we could talk pictures too, but I think this is related to the schematic itself. Um, obviously you want to maintain an even scale. So like if you're modeling it after a flat lay photo that you took, make sure you get right above that photo so it's not skewed. Otherwise you're going to end up looking like, like even if your hip and bust measurements are the same, if you're tracing a photo that's skewed, it's going to look different. It's not going to match. You're not going to have an even depth perspective for the length of the armhole versus the side length. Right. So, I mean, if you're taking the picture with your phone, most like I know on my iPhone, you can actually skew the photo after you take yeah. it to get it to line up. Um, that's a great idea. <laughs> that's like a tool. I think we we forget that these tools are so easily available to it us. It is. There's so many free mm -hmm. options where sometimes I, that's part of me struggling with a business is I see there's so many options for newer designers or even established designers that are really just trying to trim their costs where sometimes it's hard to be like, hire me, pay me to do this. Cause I'm like, well, or you could do it yourself. Right. Yeah, exactly. So to have it skewed, not skewed. So it's the correct, uh, Right, just making sure that your, like your lines stay even. You could even, um, you can hmm. even use like the grid, like that yes. grid where there's like. Oh, I forget about that because I always have the third line grid on. Like that's just the oh, default on my phone. <laughs> I never remember to turn it on. So if if people don't know what we're talking about, it's like where it divides your. Um, frame of your picture mm -hmm. that you're taking into thirds, both yes. vertically and horizontally, and you can toggle it on or off and it helps you to line things up so that it's yes. actually like not. Yes. And it just helps with photo composition too. I worked for a photographer back, back in the day. <laughs> um, and so some of those things just kind of stuck. Yes. Yeah, this is like basic like image manipulation, but obviously we got to apply the good stuff to mm -hmm. building good images for our patterns. So I do like when I am drawing any of my schematics, I make sure that the cables or the color work is to scale. It's accurate. Like I've seen, I really admire there's a few designers that do like watercolor schematics and they're just gorgeous pieces of art, but they might have the color work exaggerated big or just or the cables are exaggerated because they want to fit in mm -hmm. or make it easier to paint which i understand but that might not help your knitter as much like there's that fine There's line no between eye artistry eye. and reference tools right and I think this is where we, you have to decide is what is the purpose of your schematic? Like right. What is it? What is it supposed to do for you in your pattern? Yes. Is it just if it's just a pretty uh, rendering of mm -hmm. the uh, aesthetic of the design, then maybe that doesn't need to be the schematic part. Right. Maybe 
So what do you think is the purpose of the schematic? Is it okay to be aesthetic with it? With it? it is. Uh, I think that mine, I've made some of mine into stickers because I like them so much. Yay! <laughs> so like, it is, oh, the light is going to reflect badly off. Oh, of no. I oh, yeah. It's got it. Look so, how gorgeous that is. But it's completely to scale at the same time. All of the stitches, like if I had this, if I could do like a screen share, I could blow it up and you would see each individual stitch. That's remarkable. <laughs> um, because I wanted it to be to scale. So, like, I actually measured out like how big are, according to gauge. Um, right. But does it need to be like that level? No. It can be a line drawing. It can be a line drawing. Actually, when you print this out, um, like my printer, I usually have it in draft mode and it doesn't print all the stitches. Mm -hmm. So in my knitting bag over there, I'm working on um, the spruce tee by Alicia Plummer. And the schematic is just a basic outline because my printer is old and awful <laughs> but it's enough like that's what i'm saying it doesn't have to be amazing mm -hmm. but it does have to be accurate and serve its function to show the maker what the dimensions are right, right? And where the right so, like you don't have to be like down to the millimeter you right. don't have to be obsessive i'm i am obsessive <laughs> well no, it, sounds like, it sounds like what's most important is that it be right and that it be yes. a true representation of the item and give you the proper dimensions. And so I think that's an important question for designers to think about. What is the purpose of the schematic? Why am I including it? Right. And if, and maybe there's, um, so yeah, I do for some people, they just want a basic schematic. So I will do, uh, like, it much faster with like basic like lines to represent the ribbing and like a thinner like a thinner or a lighter grayscale line to show where are the raglan lines right. like it doesn't have to be over the top like with every stitch represented yeah. right and that... i don't do every stitch for everything because then it would just be a blob um but so <laughs> that here, um the visual like you know for decoration stuff can be like up to interpretation as long as right. it's accurate and I just want to say don't discount like I hear what you're saying about when you were saying before to um that you feel like oh they could be doing this themselves there's free things and I you know so but remember that even if that's true um not everybody wants to do that right that's and true. that's what it comes down and, to and some people like are very happy to hire someone to do this. Like, I mean, there's yes. lots of things I know for myself. There's lots of technological tools or things that, um, you know, I don't find easy. So yeah. even though it is technically simple and I could learn it and do it myself, um, it's more challenging and more mm -hmm. frustrating than to hire someone who's going to do a yes. really good job. Um, so I'm sure- And it ends up valuing your own time right? by and paying what, somebody who can just do it instead of spending that extra time learning and struggling and not being a hundred percent happy with it. Yeah. I mean, um, you have to weigh what's, you know, what's, what's the best use of your time when you have a lot of things to do. Yes. I learned that the hard way a couple years ago, my computer was having issues and I'm like, Oh, I've good with computers. I can fix this. I spent days oh, yes. working on it. And then finally it got to a certain point and I was like, okay, I'm just going to call the local computer guy he fixed it actually what he ended up doing was he worked on it and he said your computer is not fixable but i'm not going to charge you to tell you that so like <laughs> but he saved me this ongoing frustration of just like okay your computer is reaching the end of its life right you have approximately this amount of time until you need to replace it right. stop fighting just get what you can out of it <laughs> yeah i think it, there's there's so much value in in leveraging what other people, what other skills people have that maybe we don't and really get getting into the community that we have to find how we can make our things better by being collaborative with other, with yes. other makers. And that's one thing that I had to look, I've had to learn. Um, I think a lot of us, when we start out, we're so much like, 
oh, it's a competition. It's a competition. Yeah. We have to get these clients. And it's not. It's yeah. learning to collaborate. Um, actually, I was chatting with Anne-Marie Hart recently, and she was saying, oh, you should make a class for your schematics. I said, mm -hmm. oh, teach people how to do it? She's like, yeah, they'll take the class. They'll see how hard it is, and then they'll hire you to do it. <laughs> Or you, you'll have a few people like, you know, on like I teach in uh, the grading class on the Tech yes. Editor Hub, you have people who just really jump in and want to do it. And there's yes. people who are like, yeah, okay, I took your class, but I'm not, I'm okay. I don't need this. I right. don't need this. <laughs> so I just thought that was really funny. She was like, I would take the class, but I still wouldn't do it. I just want to see what you do. We have a lot of comments about that, Sarah. Why don't you take Yeah, let me pull up this up. one first, though. Um, Josephine. Hi, Josephine from Canada. Do you ever use appropriate size croquis upon which to build your schematics? What a great question. I don't. I've been looking into the croquis. Is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess I don't have a fashion background, so I was oblivious to that as a reference tool. Um, what I do is I calculate out from the pattern exactly what every dimension will be, and I draw those dimensions. Um, I know like when I am helping to grade a garment, I go off of the different sizing reference tables, but I haven't used croquis themselves. Yeah, that, that's I like that, though, that you're actually like just building stitch by stitch, row by yes. row, what it what its shape is. Yeah, so I end up with a spreadsheet that's about this long with like, okay, this is this dimension, this is this dimension, and then putting those pieces together. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's d definitely a way to do it. So you could do it from a croquis like they do in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know what a croquis is, it's basically a an outline of a body shape in the size that you're trying mm -hmm. to represent. Yes. Yeah, um, I know Jen Pericini has mm -hmm. um, made her own custom croquis that match her body. So that way when mm -hmm. she's designing, she oh has God. a reference and a visual aid and she does gorgeous drawings of her garments, which would fall more into this, that stylized category of like, this is what it will look like when worn, how it would drape across the body. Right. Instead of laid flat, mm -hmm. which is another um, option for representing the way that the, the garment looks. So another question we got was from Marlene. Hi, Marlene. If a tech editor is hired to make a schematic in addition to editing the pattern, should that cost be included in the time used to edit or charged as an add on in a flat charge, like a flat fee? Okay. So what a great I... question. I've gone back and forth on that. I do everything by time. I will lay, list it separately on my invoice. Uh, like this is even things like this is how long it took to do the preliminary edit. This is how long it took to do the final. This is how long like different steps take. So that way designers can see how that breakdown happens and it can make it easier for them to just relate to because they're like, oh, yeah, it does take me a while to make 17 unique charts. Like, <laughs> you made all those That's charts. <laughs> well, there was one pattern that I made like 36 charts for. Wow. Tara just did that last week. I did that. Yeah, just if you yeah. want to be one of those. <laughs> and so it could just be a helpful reminder to see it on the invoice of like, oh, yeah, there were 30 some charts. Like, that is going to take a little bit of time. Um, so I list everything out separately by time, by the 15 minute mark. I will give an estimate like a uh, garment will take a minimum of two hours to draw. Mm -hmm. And then you, you put that like but, that's your minimum for what you, you charge. Yes. I just know that there's been a couple times where I've been able to get squeak under the two hour line. And if that would happen, I would charge appropriately. But I know that that's kind of where it ends up with if you want that size accuracy and it just takes a little bit of time first to calculate all the measurements and then to get it drawn yeah. out. And again, it comes down to your business model. So there isn't one way or another mm -hmm. to do it, Marlene. Like whenever I draw a schematic for a client, I'm doing super simple line drawings. 
I just charge a flat fee because right. I'm using the same images over and over again and just like yes. moving lines. And that is one factor. thing to say, like every one of my drawings is unique start to finish. Mm. I don't borrow chunks. So like your drawing is your drawing. It's your garment. Wow. And then I will send over whatever file formats the designer wants if they want it colorized. Um, like I did for Amy Cher, her coloring book Raglan series. Right. I worked with the, the two yarn dyers that she was using, and I did color matched versions mm -hmm. so that knitters would have, she has this PDF available where you can see, like, if you're using from this yarn dyer, this recommended yarn, here's color combinations that look good together. Yeah, so it actually becomes a huge reference overall, not mm -hmm. just for sizing, but it can be for the design itself, right? For yarn placement, yarn color placement. So, like, just with all those different variabilities, I don't feel like I can really say, "Oh, this is my flat fee," because either I'm going to be overcharging the designer or I'm going to be underpaying myself. That is the hard thing about flat fees, and this is what I'm telling you, you guys. This is our superpower. Like, this <laughs> theory has serious service these schematic drawings are so you gotta check out her work yeah they're just so cute like oh my gosh <laughs> well, more stickers i love yeah. it i need to like get a laptop so i can like decorate the back with all this well, i know i've been like is there a way i could do like a sticker club or something because i can't be yeah. the only person that finds these super adorable i love it i love it it's super cool well marlene also wants to know when will you be teaching how to make beautiful schematics like yours? And Yvonne, hi Yvonne from Texas. I would also <laughs> love a class. <laughs> so, no well, practice, season no is not practice. done yet. Um, <laughs> I did just get a nicer camera. So that's one step towards the process. Awesome. So I'm not just recording on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no and i get it i creating courses is yes. intense it's and you have a schematic course work. don't you and say say it again you have a course for schematics don't you yes on yes. the tech Twitter hub we do for like how do you do draw do. simple line schematics mm -hmm. in inkscape which is a, so like, a i don't want to take away from you <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I've I've taken um, the course that Jolie has on our site, which is uh, to do that with Procreate on an mm -hmm. iPad with a stylus, like what you were mentioning. And that also can be f a fun way to do it. I've done a couple of those for clients, which is fun. But yeah, yours are a little uh, <laughs> next level. So I think there's there's definitely room in the market when you're ready to teach a course. We're all here and we're all going to take it. <laughs> Well, and that leads into that question. What tools do you use? Mm -hmm. um, where is it? It's probably not even charged. I started out with my iPad and I actually used the free paper app to start. So that's paper as in P-A-P-E-R like, in the app on the iPad. Mm -hmm. And I, I had it downloaded back to my iPad, but it might have gone away again. Yeah, and I totally understand that. And actually, I can look that up. Yeah, throw the link in there. Oh, I do have it. So it is basically just, it's actually, it's really cute. And I still use it sometimes for notes mm -hmm. if it'll open, but it opens up looking like a moleskin notebook. Oh. And then you can, here, you can actually like, oh, this is, I made my first logo using this app. Nice. So you can like scroll through, it's like pages. Wow. in a notebook and it's just really basic drawing tools like it's super basic but it's mm -hmm. free and let's see how do i go back oh it wants me to rate everything now um <laughs> <laughs> it's those free apps you gotta you gotta give us a five-star review <laughs> if i could find But that's so like, oh, I see. So you can do different, like really simple, um, mm -hmm. just drawing tools. So and that's what I other... started out with. Wow. It's just a free, free app. And then actually I moved on to Sketchbook, which is another free app for either iPad or desktop. And I've done a lot. Sorry, the ring light. That's okay. I love and it. Sketchbook is nice because it does, um, 
Like you can put grid lines in so you can have a reference point, like a drawing on graph paper. You can have different layers happening. Let's see, oh. The name of that app again was? Sketchbook. 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 So yeah, like my original, I had, I used lines so that way I could plot out where I wanted things to happen. So you can see I have, there's the length of the raglan, there's the upper arm. And then using a separate layer to draw over top of it. See, and then, that, I, then I tried Procreate. Okay, but before you go on, <laughs> Sketchbook is free on yes. the desktop and it's on both Microsoft products, Google yes. Play and Apple. So that's something if you don't have yes. an iPad, but you have another yes. tablet, you can use Sketchbook. Yes, and then I went to Procreate. Yes, that's my favorite app. <laughs> I can spend all day on Procreate. <laughs> so I've done things like I made a logo for a local coffee roaster. Oh, so cute. Um, and then I even tried making my own stamps to try to streamline my process, but I found out that it would pixelate too much. Mm -hmm. That was one limitation I had with Procreate when I was replicating. It would, each replication would get blurrier. So I don't know if I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. But I know like there are people that will sell um, stamps for Procreate, like knitting textures on Etsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you, like any of these, there's so many tutorials on YouTube mm -hmm. for using these. And um, to, you can buy all kinds of things, images to download to use within your images too. So one thing that I did, like this was the original Spruce Tea that I did in Procreate. I love it. And then Alicia re-released it this year. She changed the neckline and just a little bit of the fit. So when I, now I use all Affinity products. Um, so it's this little blue logo at the bottom. And Affinity is something that we recommend, I recommend on the Tech Editor Hub and in our Tech Editing classes because you can also lay out your pattern in yes. it. And I love Affinity. We use Affinity Photo, Publisher, and Designer. So we've for had schematics. Guests, we've had a lot of guests um, here who have said the same thing. They love Affinity, and that's what they use to design. So like back in the day when I worked for the photographer, it was obviously all Adobe products. I did his digital retouching. So I did all the digital processing for his photos. So I'm familiar with like Photoshop and Lightroom from... 18 years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> um and even things like i did a lot of things with other adobe products in my different jobs over the years i like affinity better mm -hmm. i know people will that's like fighting words <laughs> if you get like a diehard adobe person but for the price and for the because overall it's a, it's intuitiveness one-time fee you don't have to buy a subscription and like I got it during COVID when they had a 50% off sale. So I got three products for the less than paying two months of wow. Adobe Cloud. Right. And it's powerful. It's a vector software. I mean, it does, it's it's a little pared down, like it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that Adobe has, but maybe you don't need all the bells and whistles for what we're doing um, as far as this level of graphic design. Yeah. And really it has see if I can open it up. Everything is stored on cloud right now. So yeah. So do you do it on your desktop or you actually use a stylus on your iPad? I do both. I have the Apple Pencil. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on what I'm doing. And also I have carpal tunnel. So mm -hmm. which is easier for me that day of the mouse or the pencil? Um, which is your favorite? Like, do you still only use Affinity or do you sometimes go back to like Procreate? I, everything else had gone off, had been offloaded off of my iPad. I use all Affinity. So like, here's the new Spruce Tea. Mm -hmm. And if I zoom in, you can see each oh, little garter stitch. <laughs> Those little ridges. <laughs> right, and it's the same thing. Um, Wow, the collar. So, I 
I love Vector for that reason. And like, I like a, a Procreate and I keep telling myself I'm going to learn how to do like digital painting. Mm -hmm. But I love the fine details and the qualities of Vector so much that I can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Thank you so yeah, much for sharing. That, that it can be scaled like forever and not lose quality. I mean, that's a really great feature. It's I know. Fun. How fun would that be? Like driving to Rhinebeck, you could see the sweater on a billboard and everything would look perfect. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. It and is. that is for, I mean, like that's like a random thing, but I think that could be so fun someday. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing these tools and a little bit of your process with us. This is so valuable. Um, I would like to ask you some questions from the perspective of a tech editor. So it's been a while since we've had like a tech editor on the show and we asked you on because we're like, we got to ask more techy questions. So I hope you don't mind if we, we pick your brain yes, a little bit. I will do my best. <laughs> so when you're tech editing, what are the errors that you come across the most? Um, I would say most of it isn't necessarily an error, but it's an oversight. It's getting that you're so familiar with your design that you forget to include something or you forget to be specific with like do a repeat this times. But is that in addition to the first instance or is that oh. total? So those little things or even um, recently I've been working on some patterns where they started out with this many sizes and they added on. But partway through the pattern, they forgot to add the extra stitch. Like they forgot that last bracket. But you're so used to seeing your own work that you just don't even see it anymore. And that's the value of having a tech editor or a test knitter. Sometimes, like I like having designers go through tech editing and then testing if they have time and then pop it back to me for that like last 45 minutes of just final polishing because sometimes like I might work with a pattern so much too that it starts, or I'm used to that designer's language. Right. And so I think they've included something and that's an error from my part of like, oh, I didn't notice that they didn't include this abbreviation because it's a standard abbreviation and I thought it was there. So now I have to make sure I go through the abbreviations page and I like do a control F search through the document, making sure are the right abbreviations here? Are there extras? Or is there something missing? Yeah, I love it. So it's just I mean, those oversight. Was... Like, I don't want to pick on a designer and say like, oh yeah, they, their math is always wrong. Because it's not. Like usually the math is correct, but it might be missing something. Exactly. So if you were talking to a brand new designer just starting out, what would be your primary advice to them if they asked? Um, if they are just starting out and they can't invest in a tech editor right away, have a good knitting friend that they trust read through their, like not the knitting friend who only knits dishcloths, but somebody who is experienced enough to be like, Hey, yeah. And that's willing to say this doesn't look right. Cause there's different levels of friendship as to whether or not you feel comfortable being that critical, helpful, critical voice, right. um, have them read through it before you send it to a test knitter, like right. use Yarn Pond, use the free testing group on Ravelry, get some eyes on your pattern before you publish it, even if it's gonna be a free pattern. Yes. Because if somebody gets your pattern and they don't, like it just doesn't make sense or there's things missing or mistakes, they're not gonna come back. No, exactly. So I've worked with a couple designers where we've spent a ton of time working on free patterns. Like um, Megan Hasley, the, like my Megan, um, she has a pattern for a headband and it's free. And we spent hours working on this thing. It has schematics. It has construction diagrams. It has illustrations for different parts. It has everything in it because she wanted people to see if this is what I'm getting with a free pattern, how much more am I going to be getting? Like, this is the quality. It's worth paying for your mm -hmm. designs. Yeah. Well, so that's kind of the thing of like when you're first starting out is being willing to invest the time or the money or both to have it polished. So that way people want to come back. 
Oh, I love it. That's great That's advice. advice. I mean, so, your free, if you're offering a free pattern and that's your model, it almost has to be your best. It has to yes. be your best work. So people right. will come back and buy your pattern. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk. So we're talking about money a little bit here. What do you think needs to change in our industry to ensure that design work is sustainable? So you're working a lot with designers on a, a variety of services for them. What do you think needs to change? Um, less free patterns. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like a designer shouldn't have more than one free pattern. Unless they're like a designer, unless they're doing it as um, like on their blog and they're making a ton of money from advertisers. Right. But nobody's making that much money from advertisers. Like you need one, maybe one free pattern to get a piece of people kind of a taste of your work. Right. But there shouldn't be 11 million free patterns on Ravelry. Right. And Amanda, and a really when good you're, point. Amanda says, use your free pattern as a loss leader, which right. is kind of like, hey, come into the store. Come see what I've got. Right. Like, like Megan, she has the headband. So there are a couple sizes, but it's not like a free garment. And then she's trying to sell you a hat pattern afterwards. Like, it's something small so you can get a sample for her work for her aesthetic um not listing your patterns for two dollars <laughs> like designers need to value their own time, time mm -hmm. and to be realistic with like okay it took me this much money in yarn this much time if i want to make even minimum wage how much would i does this pattern cost if I'm going to sell 10 copies, if I'm going to sell a hundred copies, if I'm going to sell a thousand copies, like you can't price all of your patterns expecting to make profit off of a thousand copies. Right. That's terrific. A lot of people do, but you should have a realistic, like I'm going to recoup my cost within 50 patterns, 100 patterns. I'm going to get my money back so that way it is profit. So I can afford to pay a photographer if I need to hire somebody. I can afford to pay my website hosting fees. Mm -hmm. And my tech editor. <laughs> and maybe a, the tech editor would be nice. <laughs> We're always going to say, put your money first into a tech editor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like you don't need a professional photographer. You can do a lot with a cell phone these days. Right. That makes sense. But I, it's not giving away your skill. Like the lady who contacted me this week, I looked, I wanted to see what her body of work was because she wasn't a first time designer. And my, I was just shocked. I wrote to her, I'm like, I'm, please don't take this the wrong way, but you're undervaluing yourself. Yeah. Please increase your prices because if you undervalue yourself and the next person undervalues themselves, then what happens when somebody a, actually tries to place value on their work? It's a race to the bottom instead of, and we're all sitting at the bottom yeah i was sitting at the bottom i was charging ten dollars an hour because i'm like mm. nobody knows who i am how can i do more than that yeah i i, I agree it's, well, there's... congratulations sweetheart i'm very happy for that you. i'm not charging ten dollars an hour anymore <laughs> yes i hope not <laughs> So tell us what you're excited about now. Like, what do you have on deck that just like gets you up in the morning and super excited about your work? I've just been excited with just the variety of different people that I'm working with right now. Like I have my clients that I've been working with for five or six years now, and I absolutely love them. Um, and I want to keep working on their patterns forever, but it's exciting to me to wake up and I have an email from somebody in the UK, an email from somebody that I have no connection to. And then I look, they're not following me on Instagram. Like, I don't even know how they found me sometimes. <laughs> but they and then I write to them and they're like, Oh, we saw you, you're, you did this for such and such a person. And we just loved it. And um, I just did a shawl schematic for Victorious Knits. I think she's releasing it later this month or next month. I don't remember. And I spent a lot of time and I changed the way I did my, sh my cables. And I'm so excited with this, the depth of squishiness that I was able to capture. 
So I'm constantly just trying, like I said, I'm a, a little obsessive, kind of a perfectionist. <laughs> and so that's what, <laughs> that's what I get excited about is just seeing that constant improvement. Like looking back at my drawings from last year, I still like them. Could they be better? Could I do something different? Yeah. Looking at layouts, like, okay, the pattern layouts, I have a couple of people that I help with their layouts. It was good, but what can we do to make it even better? I love it. This is you who we how all through this interview for the last since we since the beginning, she casually drops these other services that she has <laughs> and these other specialties that she does, like just casually, oh, layout, charts, you know, just I love it. Logos, you know, whatever. <laughs> perfectionist which is like a super quality in a deck editor yeah i love it and and this is how this is how we can have a sustainable business as a tech editor this is what i tell people is you can't just offer tech editing learn how to do all other things that you are super good at so that you can offer yeah. a range of services so you're not always in your head in the spreadsheet yes you're doing something creative too or you're you're doing providing a more robust service for your clients so yeah. last year i was learning about the what they call the female presentation of adhd and i was like oh that's me this is why i get bored and i want to learn how to do it better or do something yes. different or just add on things so i enjoy mm -hmm. doing them all but i don't want to do the same thing I, I should say that I was a cashier at a grocery store in high school and I actually loved it because even though it was repetitive, there was all the different people and just I, it wasn't repetitive at the same time. Yes. So like editing, I love editing and but it's great because every pattern is different. Every pattern needs something different. Every designer has their own voice. So preserving that voice. Yeah, I love it. It's always a different challenge, even if it's the same thing. <laughs> right. Yep. What a great description. I love yep. that you you described it that way because it's really true how and why it appeals to us who have this brain. Like we're so we're into the details. We we notice what's wrong and we're ready to improve it, but it's not the same every day. It's like it's well, and that's what's also important about tech editing for independent designers. Right. And tech editing for more than one designer is valuing the the uniqueness and the differences while also maintaining accuracy mm -hmm. yeah and then also recognizing that you might work with a designer who you like but you struggle with their voice mm -hmm. and so there's been a couple times where i've been happy to let go of clients because their voice was really hard for me to edit yeah like it just it felt like i was always struggling to understand like their instructions made sense kind of like um i know i've heard people say kind of that like this formatting that nitty uses mm -hmm. some people love it some people don't so just recognizing that you might you can do it but you might not be the best person to do it right yeah. and that's which that community that collaboration is important to be able yes. to say like even those actually, I just recommended you yesterday, Christina, because somebody was saying, you know, I'm working on this design and I'm kind of feeling stuck. And I said, well, when you get through that stock, I can help you because it'll cost too much for me to like hold your hand all the way. I said it nicer. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, it would cost too much. I don't want to charge you that much time. Yeah for how I would work through it at this point. Like, I don't want to take over and do it all for you. But if you're really feeling stuck, contact someone like Christina, who will give yeah. you that one-on-one -on -one consultation and help you break through that stuck. Yeah. Well, thank you, Becky. <laughs> well, recognizing like I, it would take me too long to process and you've got it down. Like you can do that consultation in an hour and get them going again. Whereas I would have to sit with the pattern and you're just at a different place than I am. This well, and this I'm not going to be doing any schematics for anybody, <laughs> I promise you. This is you why we're in okay. the community. We don't, we don't happening. work alone. We don't work alone. We, we no, are part no. of a community where we're collaborating and there's it's not competition. No. Because we need each other. Right. What you're really good at, I'm not. And what she's good at, it, it's just better. We, we're almost to the top. I, of, we're, we're I almost, talk a lot. <laughs> Oh, we do too. Trust me. We have lots of talking. <laughs> we, 
We're almost to the top of the hour. We have one more question from our audience, and then we're going to ask you a couple fun questions, and okay. then we'll wrap up for today. Um, Nicola, hi, Nicola. Thanks for being here. How do you show off your work done? Are your designers okay with you showing work in progress on social media, et cetera? I'm new to tech editing, so I don't want to impinge on my designer's own market preferences. Okay. So that is something that I know I was talking with Anastasia a while back and she was like, well, you need to like, can you show any of your process? And I said, not really, because this isn't my work to show. Mm -hmm. So I don't show work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while, I might show like a like a very rough beginning sketch. But even that I don't really show because it doesn't show the designer's work to its best. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I, the biggest thing is communicating with your client, asking them what they're comfortable with. I always ask permission. Can I use one of your finished photos as a release announcement? Can I, are you okay with me sharing an image of your schematic? It would be a very compressed form on social media. Um, obviously without any measurements. Um, are you okay with that? What is your preference? Do you want just to me not to say anything? Like, where are you at with this? And most of the time the designers are like, oh, it'd be great if you did. Would love to do that. Um, they might have a preference, like a colorized or a not colorized version of the schematic, uh, more of a zoomed out view or like cropped into one section so that like the schematic won't give away more than the pattern pictures do. But at the same time, it can feel like it might like, um, I don't know if I ever shared a picture of a uh, color work hat I did for Alicia because I felt like it gave away too much information about because mm -hmm. it was accurate to the stitch count. So I don't want people to sit there and like count. <laughs> <laughs> so I never shared. I think I might have shared like a little bitty one and like an Instagram stories where you can't see the stitches, but you can see the overall pattern. Get the concept of it. Right. Like I don't want to give away their work. I want to promote their work and yeah. I want to promote it to its best, which is the finished. Right. And, and I love how you're talking about where communication is key. Yeah. So uh, we talk about this a lot that when you're dealing with client work and you're providing a service, communication is the most important. Yes. And well, even like when I was saying, like, I might have my friend do a second proofreading for me. She's technically my assistant at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I will still ask the designer of like, I've been working on this a lot. I just want to make sure I haven't overlooked anything. Are you okay with my assistant? Right who I completely trust doing a proofread just to make sure her brain works differently than mine. Right. Does everything flow correctly to her? Cause she'll say, you know, this wording is just clunky or it's like, right. it's not clicking. Yeah. So it can be helpful, but I wouldn't do that without asking the designer yeah. first because it is theirs. I love this. This is, this is like key to running a good, client-based business is communicating and having clear expectations on what exactly is happening with the person's design because it does belong to them, not to us. So we have one fun question that we're going to ask you and okay. then we're going to wrap up for today. This is our favorite question that we ask every guest. What is your favorite knitting or crochet no notion? <laughs> um, I should have grabbed a couple of them. I wear how do I point to the right thing on camera? <laughs> I, I love bags, bags and stitch markers, but I would say I probably, well, the bags are a bigger purchase price. Like I have this, um, that way, that way, <laughs> the yellow, um, it's the mini Le Pouf bag from mm -hmm. Rosie is a rose. I, I can add her Instagram link. But I got two of them. They're these really cute hexagon bags. Like the base is a hexagon and then the panel. So it stands up and it's almost like a portable knitting bowl. Oh, that's so cool. Love it. But then even inside that bag, I have four other bags inside that bag <laughs> because I need to compartmentalize. I love this. I love this so much. Bags. I love it. Compart bags and bags that compartmentalize yes. the stuff. I love it so much. One of my daughters stole some of my makeup recently. We worked through that, but I was like, 
Okay, this is a very deliberate choice because that makeup was inside this bag, inside this bag, inside this bag. Like you <laughs> went hunting for it. <laughs> She's like, but mom, you didn't wear it. <laughs> I know, Aww. but you still went hunting instead of asked. <laughs> so bags and bags and bags. I oh, love yeah. that you it but this is true we gotta have we have to have things to hold our stuff in <laughs> and so if it's all important. organized my brain doesn't have to think about it <laughs> yeah so um christina's going to put into the comments who you find in her uh, her contact info where can people find you online and are you taking on new clients i am taking on new clients right now i am booking about three weeks out because it is prime knitting season I know. And so I'm trying to make sure I hold spaces for my existing clients, but still fitting in new things because right. I like variety. Um, I was able to get my name as my URL. So it's just beckymonahan.com. Nice. There you go. <laughs> and then um, Instagram, I went with Monahan Tech Edit, all strung together. My email is the same, monahantechedit at gmail.com. There's a contact form on my website, which I'll is linked that. to, like everything's linked together. I tried to I... make it easy. That's awesome. We so much enjoyed having you on today. We love hearing how your brain works and how you've combined the beauty of art and design into the technical aspect of everything that needs to happen in a knitting pattern, including excellent schematics. And we're super excited to see where you go, Becky. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, so thanks for having me. On your success and your hard work. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, you. thank you for joining us today. And thank you for um, everything that uh, that you shared with us. It's super special. We'll see you Thank later. You. Okay. Bye. Bye, Becky. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, oop, I got to be on the left. There we go. <laughs> so um, we have a couple of announcements. Um, we This broadcast is only made possible because we have Patreon support. Um, our patrons are our lifeblood. They're our excitement. Um, if you come and you'd like to support our broadcast and be a part of our network, when you join Patreon, you get access immediately to our Discord, uh, which is a server, but it's also like a forum where you can ask us questions and join us for knit nights. And yeah, it's such a great, it's like, I love it. It's like a little place, you know, um, and it's all different topics on the side and you can choose what you want to talk about and what conversations you want to join. You have, a, you have more access to us if you have questions for us or you want to be in community with us. You can do that through Patreon. It's pretty great. And our patrons make this, this episode completely possible because we're able to pay our overhead costs for the streaming software and also to pay our guests. So thank you, patrons. We appreciate you very much. Um, and don't forget to sign up for our newsletter um, and to subscribe here on YouTube because... If you subscribe here, you'll get notification when we have a new broadcast. And we also send an informational newsletter with all the links of everything that we're up to. Um, what's, what's next is November, Monday, November 21st, same time, same place. We have another guest lined up for a great interview. And we'd love to have you join us. And the first place to find out about all of that is the newsletter, too. Yes, That's exactly. Really good idea to sign up, which... Um... Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. We're so glad that you could be here with us. And we are super excited that you could be here to hear our talk with Becky. And we'll see you next month. Bye, Take everybody. care. Bye.